U.S. Marnish Radio is part of designnetwork.org, exclusive architecture and design podcasts reaching creative listeners worldwide. Hi, I'm Elizabeth A.T. Smith. I'm the author of Blueprints for Modern Living, History and Legacy of the Case Study Houses, and we're listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. This is the fifth year U.S. Modernist Radio has covered the New York Architecture and Design Film Festival. If by festival you mean mostly online, and by New York you mean all over the planet. Every year, producers, experts, stars, and creators gathered to premiere their latest architecture and design documentaries. And this past year, with COVID subsiding but still concerning, executive director Kyle Bergman had a hybrid schedule of virtual and in-person screenings. Today, George talks with people behind three of those documentaries, Nico Weber of Inside Perora, Lauren Levine of Unity Temple, Frank Lloyd Wright's modern masterpiece, and Nathan Eddy of Battleship Berlin. Later on, a special musical guest you saw last year on America's Got Talent, Storm Large. And now, still hurting from Frank Gehry's continuing rejections, here's your host, Mr. Modernism, George Smart. Hey, thanks, Tom. Not that I haven't tried, for years really, to get Frank Gehry on the show. I mean, while still turning out amazing buildings, he is in his 90s and probably has better things to do than talk to us. A friend of his recently told me that Frank is limiting his appearances. Oh, well. The invitation's still open, Frank. Did you know, Tom, that Frank Gehry spent his honeymoon decades ago in a hotel designed by John Lautner? Oh, the one in Palm... In Desert Hot Springs. Oh, yeah, outside of Palm Springs? Oh, it's an amazingly designed four rooms at the Hotel Lautner that are still going. Yeah. You can book one of these, just like Frank Gehry did. No honeymoon required. People do have weddings there, though, and receptions, and U.S. Modernist takes a group every February to watch a dramatic sunset while sipping wine and chatting with past podcast guests Tracy Beckman and Danny Heller, who run the place. In fact, a picture I took of sunset a couple of years ago there is still the desktop wallpaper on my computer. It's memorable. It's pretty. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Modernist Realtor Angela Roll. In a timeless adventure we are completely making up, Realtor Angela Roll grew up in Estonia, the daughter of a former ambassador wrongly accused of spying on next door Lithuania. He was cleared, it turns out, because Estonia only has six spies, and everybody pretty much knows who they are. After a night of partying with Lurk Bouzier's son, Buzi Kabuzier, Angela took the ferry across to the Gulf of Finland, causing an international incident involving a little red dress, a wood-turning lathe, the Finnish Coast Guard, and a $2,400 bar tab she accidentally signed over to Björk. Oops. Angela escaped the resulting media frenzy on a train to Denmark in the company of international man of mystery Eric Arhus, whom she later married, and then moved to North Carolina to become a real estate agent, specializing in modernist houses. Angela advises buyers and sellers on everything from appropriate renovation to shipping a lathe from Helsinki. Reach her at AngelaRoll.com, that's R-O-E-H-L, or 919-995-0550. Thank you, George. Based in Berlin, director, author, and producer Nico Weber studied philosophy and German literature. She worked as a print journalist for Die Volsch and as an editor for the program Kulturzeit. For more than 20 years, her TV productions have been broadcast throughout Europe, examining philosophical questions, especially the challenges of filming the unfilmable. And what's more unfilmable, really, than a gigantic Nazi-sponsored indoctrination camp slash vacation resort on the Baltic Sea, abandoned for decades? Here's George with Nico Weber and her first full-length feature film, Inside Prora. Nico, Prora has been around for a long time, and we'll talk about its origins, but it seems like it's getting a lot of attention in this last 10 or so years. Why is that? 
Oh, I think uh, the attention Flora gets in the last 10 years is because it was forgotten for so long, <laughs> completely forgotten, I would say. And in the last 10 years, everything changed in Flora. It's kind of a huge and really impressive transformation process because Flora was once the monster by the sea, the Colossus of Rügen, and it was a completely abandoned site for a very, very long time. And since I think since 2012 or so, the transformation process started. And in the meantime, it's completely sold to different investors who tried to rebuild and renew the whole area and the building itself, of course. How did it get started? I mean, why did the Nazi party want to build this giant thing? It's it's nearly five kilometers long. Yeah, it's 4.5 kilometers long and it's five blocks left. In former times, of course, it was uh, seven blocks and two blocks are still there, but completely abandoned. It was built during the era of National Socialism. And I think they started in 1936, the National Socialist, with a very, um, how can I describe it in English, with a disturbing idea uh, to make propaganda, of course, and to give the German worker a present, which means holiday, which was, of course, very unusual at this time. And if the historians are right, it was Hitler's own idea to build a huge, the most gigantic seaside resort in the world for the German worker. And so they started with Proa in 1936, and they stopped, of course, in 1939 because uh, Second World War started. And that was the reason why Proa was never finished. So there were never uh, someone making holidays there in Proa. So it was completely abandoned after that and was converted to one of the largest barracks, the TDR and became then an abandoned site for many years following Germany's reunification, of course. But why so big? I mean, why would Hitler want to make something at this scale? Why wouldn't he just make a kind of typical resort with 500 or 1,000 rooms? I mean, this is enormous. It's the idea of propaganda. Well, you can say Prora was something like a prototype for Hitler. Uh, Prora was the first seaside restore that should have been built and four more in the same size were planned. And it's so interesting because the idea of mass tourism was not originally the idea of the National Socialist, but it's connected to it somehow because before Prora, they tried to establish the Strength Through Joy organization and they had a prototype compared to the Strength Through Joy organization in Italy. And they tried to give the German workers something like a, a holiday. I'm not sure how can I explain it in English, because in this sense, it's not really a holiday because you're in a 4.5 kilometers long building and you're surrounded by 20,000 other people. Is it more of an indoctrination center to where they would be? Oh, that was the word I was looking for, indoctrination. Yes, yes. I think that's it. That's the point. That was the idea in the core of the propaganda. Yes. So this was a way to take people off for what looked like a seaside holiday, and it was really an indoctrination place. Yes, definitely. I would say so, yeah. Now, the architect of this was Clemens Klotz. Am I saying that right? Yeah, Clemens Klotz is right. Who has on his resume Nazi architect, which is never a good thing. What did Klotz do besides Prora? Really, to be honest, I have no clue. And why? Because I think at the end, the architect doesn't play a really big role in terms of Prora. Because to be honest, Prora is a really banal building. It's kind of, I would say, even ugly. It's an ugly building, and it's not something you would consider to be a very good work of an architect, you know? It's just about masses, and it's just about looking at people like ants. And I wouldn't say that Clemens Klotz is an architect in the modern sense, in the modernist sense. I wouldn't say so. No, I, I wouldn't say so either. It looks like he 
lived another 30 years. He died in 1969. Yeah. He did a new domed train station in Munich. Oh. And he did some master planning for the city of Cologne. Yeah. But other than that, there's not a whole lot about him. I think he was a good friend of the chief of the German Arbeiterfront, Deutsche Arbeitsfront, which was a propaganda organization of Adolf Hitler, and a very good friend of Robert Ley. And so all people who were working as architects and also as all companies in Prora, they came from originally this part of Germany where Robert Ley was also from. I think there was a huge amount of corruption around all the commissioned things that they built there in Prora, and it had nothing to do with uh, the contest. The scale of this building is really something. It was designed for 20,000 people in 10,000 rooms. And of course, yeah. as you said, it was, it was abandoned for many decades. When did there start to be interest in restoring it and turning it into what it is now as a hotel and hostel and other features? I think there were several steps. In 2005 or 2006, there was always, uh, for a very long time, a huge debate about what to do with Flora. Because at the beginning, you know, everyone wanted to get rid of it. And it's very important not to forget, because Flora, after the National Socialism and after the Second World War, it was, of course, converted to one of the largest barracks in the TDR. And that was before it became an abandoned site. And what does that mean? It was a secret place. It was not possible to enter Prora. It was not possible to see it on uh, maps or something like that. And no one knew about Prora for a very, very long time. So that means after the Berlin Wall fell, no one realized that there is still at this wonderful breach at the Baltic Sea, such a huge building and the second largest architectural legacy from the National Socialists still there. So in 2005, I think it became a listed building. And after that, 10 years or so after that, because Prora is a part of one of the poorest parts of the country in Germany, they decided to sell it in parts, of course because they couldn't get rid of it. And after it was a listed building, of course, it's done. So you have to do something with it. And they have to invest money into it. And uh, that was only possible in terms of a new transformation process, for example, hotels and uh, holiday homes, which are then coming up in the protected building on one of Germany's most beautiful beaches, of course. So how do the Germans feel about repurposing the building for a new non-Nazi application? Oh, that's hard to answer. <laughs> because I think in general, the point is, Prora is not evil enough, you know? <laughs> it's not evil enough to be a huge 4.5 kilometer museum, for example, or to be a 4.5 kilometer cultural site. You have to do something with it. So I think many Germans think that it's probably a good transformation process for Pro because you have no choice. And in the meantime, in if you would have asked me in 2015, I would have said, no, I think you should leave it there and it should, you should keep it as an abandoned site. But in the meantime, I know all the people there are trying to give this whole area a new perspective, which is really hard even if it's a listed building, of course. And I think that there are many people who are very engaged to still remember the history, to still remember the history of the National Socialists, to still remember the Second World War, to still remember, of course, the next dictatorship who came in in Prora, which was the GDR. And uh, on the other hand, of course, there are many people as well, uh, maybe the same amount, I'm not quite sure, who look at Prora with a kind of a nostalgia, you know, and who go back there and buy holiday homes there and completely ignore the whole history. I think they're both sides, of course, yes. Prora is located on the island of Rügen, which is in the north of Germany, and you can go on Google and see it from the satellite. It looks like that there are two large sections 
of Prora. Was it always that way or was something in the middle destroyed? Yes, it was always that way because in the middle was kind of a huge area which was thought, I remember it, for propaganda events from the National Socialists. It had the form of a ship. I'm not quite sure if you can see it from the satellite views. I'm, I'm not sure, but it's still there, of course. And so these are two large sites. They are connected, but they had one huge corridor originally, which was really... 4.5 kilometers long, yeah. Yes. And was there a transportation system too? Were there ways for people to get around this giant complex? No, because okay. I think the idea in general was if you are there like an ant, if you're standing at the beach and looking at Pro, you don't see how huge it is at the end. You just see it from the sea or from above, or from the sky. But if you are there, if you are inside Prora, you have these long corridors. But the perception of the building itself is, uh, I would say, limited. Of course, it's a mass building, but that is the interesting thing about the, pro the building itself. It's not high, it's just long, you know, 4.5 kilometers long, but it's just five floors. So you cannot imagine how huge it is at the end. And people can visit there now. There is a large youth hostel. There is a retirement center. There's quite a few different kinds of housing available mm -hmm. on the property. Yes, good research. Yes, it is. And I assume you've stayed there. Yes. What was it like to stay in Prora? There's a difference between I and my team. Of course, we filmed once in Prora in abandoned park. And we stayed overnight there and filmed during the night. And that was quite interesting because you hear sounds everywhere and it's really spooky. It's a little bit like compared with a child going into the dark basement and searching for boxes with secret mystical stories in it, for example. And that was quite interesting because in the abandoned parts of Prora, the nature itself, as well as the animals, really, you hear the sounds from them by night. And the other thing was when we were filming there, we stayed in one of the hotel blocks, which is block two, the Pura Solitaire, which is an average, normal, very comfortable hotel in the meantime. Nico, is Inside Prora going to be available to the public on streaming networks or is it going to be on the festival circuit for a while? It's uh, still on the festival circuit until spring 2020 because we just finished the film at the end of 2019. I wanted to start with a festival, uh, with a festival circus around uh, spring 2020. And then as you probably know, um, uh, the pandemic started and uh, there were no festivals anymore and everyone was just online. And so it felt like, uh, I think it was really depressing for the whole team and of course, like many films uh, uh, who were produced at that time, uh, fell in like, a, I would say, a big black hole of the COVID pandemic. Uh, that was really a quite challenging time, I would say. So it will take a little while uh, to get out there. Hopefully it's 2022. Yeah. The film is Inside Prora. Thank you, Nico, for talking with us. Thank you very much. That was George talking with Nico Weber of Inside Prora. Lauren Levine produced hundreds of hours of television in the last 20 years, launching her career at Whitewater Films in Los Angeles as Director of Development for Rick Rosenthal. She has produced and directed network, reality, and documentary programming for ABC Family, Discovery, Disney, TLC, Warner Brothers, Lifetime, National Geographic, and TV One. She headed to Chicago to document a task that's never easy, restoring a Frank Lloyd Wright building. Here's George's conversation with Lauren about her new film, Unity Temple, Frank Lloyd Wright's Modern Masterpiece. Lauren, in looking through some of your past work, you've been involved with one of my favorite shows, Modern Marvels. How was it to work on that? <laughs> That's great. You know, I would be out, just out and about, and whoever I met almost People knew about Modern Marvels. It was just, it's such a great show and it was a great show for History Channel. I, I, my experience was great with Modern Marvels. In fact, I kind of approached this documentary 
in that way because you have to be very organized and figure out what you're going to shoot and you don't have a lot of time and you have to wrap your head around a difficult subject matter usually. So if it was the Oakland Bay Bridge or icebreakers, you know, you had to educate yourself about that. So I really enjoyed that aspect of it. How did you first come across this project? Was it your association with the building or with Wright or this construction project that was going to go forward? What was it? It was actually a friend of mine who took the on the role of executive director at the time, Heather Hutchinson. She's not in that position anymore, but we were friends and she told me about this new job she had and the restoration. And I just immediately said, I wasn't really thinking of myself as doing a documentary, but I said, well, that's fantastic. You should definitely document that. Or what are your plans to document it? And it evolved into the board and Heather and and Brad White deciding to actually make a documentary about it. And what year was this? 2015. Okay. (laughs) So it was a while ago that that's when they started construction. And even before I knew I was going to actually do a film, I sent a camera person out to the site in Chicago to film the building in its existing state before they put the fencing and the scaffolding up, just in case we decided to do it. So I would have that footage of the building in its current state. You know what I mean? So once they had the scaffolding and the fencing up, you wouldn't be able to see it. Before construction started in 2015, how many years had they been working on the permissions and the planning and getting the experts and getting the budget and all that? You know, I think Gunny Harbo, the lead architect, I think at some point in our interviews and discussions, he might have been working on it for 20 years. It it was a long time. I think there was various stages of decision making and should we do it this way and should we do it that way? And then, of course, the funding and then Alpha Wood Foundation came through with the funding. And I think once that ball got rolling... I really can't say for sure, but I'm sure it took them at least a year or two to gear up. It's an incredible amount of research and work going before you even put the scaffolding up. I mean, this really was sort of like a modern marvels for modernism, wasn't it? It really, exactly. It it really was, yeah. What did they discover when they were doing the demolition part of it? that they didn't know was there? Well, I think it was the roofing above the classroom that was the biggest discovery. And so that involved the the second skylight. And I, I can't you know, speak to the extreme ins and outs of that, but it would definitely was a surprise and it definitely was a big expense. There was, the concrete was uneven. There had been water damage there that they, hadn't seen, hadn't gotten to, you know what I mean? It didn't, hadn't shown it's the damage yet, but once they started to get up into the corners there, they, they saw there was a unevenness in the roof. So they had to add to it and build on top of that. The building had been pretty much patched together for decades, right? Well, they did this whole thing in the seventies where they did the shot Creek process and kind of um, restored some of the concrete that had been damaged. And then at some point, I didn't put this in the film, but uh, at some point there was a piece of the roofing or something that fell in the sanctuary that didn't hurt anybody. But that was, I think, another little inspiration for them to get going on the overall restoration. Was that the ghost of Frank Lloyd Wright being pissed off about something? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's right. You know, you know, you really can feel him. It's interesting. There was a guy, um, Joe Siri, who I just loved. He was in the film. And I had this really special moment that it, it didn't work in the film, but this really great moment at the end of interviewing him. He spent so much time in his research in this wonderful book that he wrote about Frank Lloyd Wright and Unity Temple and other liberal religious buildings at the time. So it's a really wide study, but very, very detailed. And I said, you know, did you miss right in a way? Did you? And he said, you know, I, I, I really did. He really felt kind of like you said, like he didn't say his ghost, but he really felt the presence 
of right in his life because he had done so much painstaking research on the details of why he chose this and why he chose that. You know, um, like in the film, he says how Wright was very concerned with the textures. And I loved those moments because for me, that was what was interesting about it for me was to tell the story in the details, you know, and that's again, what makes a good modern marvels is you, you make those details as interesting as you can, you know, it's not going to get everybody in the audience because everybody in the audience might not care about the granules and the texture of the concrete and the colors and the, you know, the texture of the paint and things like that. But Joe just was really, it was just really touching really to hear him say that he had spent so much time with him that he was kind of, feeling kind of low when he wasn't digging into Wright's life in the same way. One of the prominent features of the house that's talked about in the film is the experience of going into the building through the entranceway and then coming into the main sanctuary. Describe that for our listeners. Yes. Yes. He, I think he did Wright himself did refer to it as this path of discovery and Blair came in, the architectural critic at the Tribune. I realized when he came to do his interview, he was so articulate. We sat him down in the chair and did the interview, but then we we had him walk us through it. So we used part of that in the film. Um, but it, it really is a magical experience because you, when you've, if you've not been there before, you walk into the main area that's sort of the lobby. And on one side is the the house and the other side is the sanctuary, but you don't know that until you've actually walked either down some steps or up some steps and the steps on the side that go into the sanctuary, you'll see there's a few shots in the film where you can see people look like they're kind of, oh, what do you call that when you're at a symphony, you're in in the lower seating, you know, and you can look through, you can kind of look through the pass-through. So you can see the pastor, but you're on a lower level your eye line is below where the pastor is standing at the um, podium. And then there's inside you walk in again, there's a shot where Blair describes it. And then you open up and there's these, you know, three other levels of seating, but no matter where you sit, everyone can see everyone else. So it really, and that was important to write. And that actually speaks to the, you know, the history of the Unitarian church. They always wanted to, have it be community centered and have people looking at each other rather than the traditional pews, you know, where you walk down and everybody's facing the front and nobody sees the other person. Like the Quakers. Exactly. The Quakers. That's right. Yeah. What other kinds of churches did Wright design? Do you know? You know, he did a Greek Orthodox um, temple. I don't know if that's what you call it. It's in Wisconsin. I can't remember the name of it, but I know there was that in Wisconsin. And I think he did a smaller church, I think also in Wisconsin. He also did a synagogue somewhere, I I seem to recall. That's right. Yes. Where is that? Um, I don't know. I can't think of it off the top of my head. Well, listeners, you should be Googling for this now. So go for it. That's right. I know. I I wanted, I'm tempted to Google as you're asking me. (laughs) (laughs) When was the renovation completed? It was the summer of 18, I think. Yeah. Of 18. Summer of 18. And I guess except for the construction phase of this, this is a building that has been almost always open to the public for touring. That's right. Yeah. You can go during the week as part of the overall experience of Oak Park with all the different right houses. And of course, the Roby House is one of the most famous. Yeah. And the studio is literally down the street. I mean, it's really a fantastic tour. You could spend at least two days really doing that because the studio tour itself is an afternoon. And then in the summer, I think they still do it. They have these walking tours so that you can, again, right in the neighborhood. So you're near his studio and then you walk that neighborhood and you can see a few of his prairie style houses and I'm sure the Roby House has its own tours, especially now that that's been restored as well. And Unity Temple, I think I'm guessing that when you do a tour with a tour guide, that it's probably two or three hours because there's they tell you a lot of history and they walk you around to every part of the building. I mean, it seems incredible when you think about it, that it would take you two or three hours to go through a building. But when you really 
start like the film itself when you really start thinking about why did he build it this way why did he choose concrete why did he you you know he used so much glass and the the type of glass that he used every little thing was so detailed in its creation the way he chose the paint that had these two levels of uh like a transparent gel kind of thing and then the paint on the top and then the texturing of the plaster it's just so detailed i mean he looking for the concrete to match the concrete was a huge process in itself so yeah it's a really wonderful experience and even though i think the directors of photography that i used we they did a great job and we have some wonderful what we call the beauty shots but it's just not the same as being there it is really a different experience and and wonderful experience to be in the building now without giving away any spoilers What's the climax of the film? What's the moment at which they go like, oh, my God, I don't think we're going to be able to finish this? <laughs> you know, I thought about, boy, I, w- I wish there was a way to build a lot of suspense, but it really, the climax is really more, this building is now the way it looked 100 years ago, and we hope it'll st- look this way for another hundred years. That's really the accomplishment of the, which I really loved learning about the idea of preservation overall, you know, historic preservation of these really important buildings. Yeah. Did they have to bring it up to certain new codes or did they get exempted from that? No, they did. And there was a couple, in fact, there's a shot in the film that I I wish, but you just can't avoid it. Gunny Arbo, the lead architect, one of the codes was the, the exit signs. You know, so you have these bright red exit signs. And of course, it doesn't, you know, look that great in and it's not what right. Right would never have wanted that in the doorways leaving the sanctuary. But, you know, you have to have it. And then the the ADA stuff and they so which it looks really good. But they they made they had a lot of discussion about a wheelchair lift to get people up the stairs and or up and they built a ramp on the back side of the building which it looks it let looks really great there was some lighting issues too and of course the air conditioning and the heating the the new high tech geothermal system was of course very complicated but really interesting you know in the way that they made it work within the bowels of the building. You know, they really use the space there. In fact, part of the geothermal system is behind the podium where the organ used to be. Oh, uh, There's a hidden space behind where the pastor is. And part of the geothermal goes down through there, down into the, again, into the bowels of the building, into these long, deep, deep cavernous pathways under the ground. And that's where they put the, the geothermal system. So they dug down beneath exactly the temple to get the geothermal going. Exactly. Did they get anything exempted being a historical structure that they didn't have to put back? I'd have to ask Gunny. I don't think so. In all the time that I spoke to people and, you know, was there so much of the time, I never heard that. It seems that the main challenge from looking through the film was the concrete and the people didn't understand that Concrete is like bread, and there's so many different types and consistencies. It's still bread in the end, and it's still strong like concrete. But the the way you put it all together can vary tremendously. Yeah, that's a great analogy, the bread. (laughs) Yes, and apparently Wright was, in fact, well ahead of his time in terms of the way he used the rebar and and the way he used the cantilevers and the way that each the roof sat on top of each other. It was an ingenious design. And for that reason, really, I didn't spend a lot of time talking about, well, you know, there's this cliche out there. Well, you know, rights, buildings, everybody makes the jokes, you know, that they leak. But who cares? I mean, (laughs) a lot of structures have that problem. And it's true. He didn't know then where the spots would weaken. He didn't know then that the the rebar would corrode, but it it really was a really forward thinking way to design it. And the concrete itself, of course, was a, I, I don't know if it was all of an economic decision, but it was certainly part that because concrete was cheaper than brick. But I think he did have this idea of this 
massive block like structure. And then he continued to do that in a lot of his houses. There's a, a couple of houses here in LA, Hollyhock that uses concrete. He, he used it a lot. He used that. You could see bits of unity temple in some of the, the houses that he did in, in concrete. When you were putting together the film, did you find any original video of when the building was built? I assume there were still photographs from somebody. Yeah, you know, I wish I did. Uh, there, I did. They did hand me a box of, of old VHSs and and CDs and things, and I went through quite a bit of it, hoping, you know, hoping for a little gem of some wonderful footage or something. But no. And it was amazing. Actually, that's one of the reasons I was able to convince the board and the executive director towards the end to let me spend a little extra money and bring in a a really top director of photography. Because, you know, I said, when is this ever going to happen again? When are you ever going to film this building in all its glory? Now's the time to do it. And, um, We spent four days, if you can imagine, with a a camera crew, just me and a camera person and a a camera assistant, filming the building, the close-ups of the walls, the beauty shots, and then the light coming in. We were sitting there, actually, I think it was the last day, and of course, it's Chicago, so you can't predict the weather. And it was a cloudy day, which was kind of a bummer. We were done. We were tired. The camera gear was gone, and we were sitting in the sanctuary, and all of a sudden, the sun popped up into those windows, those clear story windows up at the top. And I said, guys, guys, I'm so sorry, but get the camera. (laughs) So we ran and got the camera set up and we probably got, I don't know, six or eight really wonderful shots of the light shining through and, and just all different aspects of the building and the light, the sun just popped up and we had about, I don't know, maybe 20, 20 minutes. And I was so happy to get those shots because they're, they're all they all play at the end of the film. Is there a place that the public can view the film or is it going to be in the festival circuit now? It's now in the festival circuit and um, I'm, I'm about to make a distribution deal. So I would imagine it would be available on, you know, the myriad of streaming platforms like the Hulus and Amazons and the distributor will pitch it and, and sell it to these various platforms. It might even be on the movies on American Airlines. Uh, the Those kinds of deals, they kind of throw the net wide. But yeah, I would look for it in on the streaming platforms. I would think by the spring, maybe the summer. The film is called Frank Lloyd Wright's Modern Masterpiece, Unity Temple. And this is Lauren Levine. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks, George. Really great to talk to you. We are back in Berlin now with American filmmaker Nathan Eddy. He studied journalism, architecture, and filmmaking at Northwestern University before moving to Germany in 2008. In addition to his work as a writer and filmmaker, Nathan has worked with preservationists to aid landmarking efforts for endangered works of modernist and postmodern architecture. In 2017, he led the effort to save the postmodern Philip Johnson and John Burgey AT&T building in Manhattan. You know the one, it has the Chippendale top. In 2018, he was unsuccessful in his efforts to save the Helmut Jahn building in Chicago. His new film, Battleship Berlin, concerns plans by the city's powerful Charité Hospital to destroy a brutalist icon of the Cold War era, an animal research laboratory known as the Mausebunker. George has an idea about that to run by Nathan. Here's his conversation with Nathan Eddy about his new film, Battleship Berlin. Nathan, before we start talking about the the mouse bunker, I want to talk with you about another building first, a building that I don't really understand. I understand it less than the mouse bunker, and that's 550 Madison Avenue. You were very involved in working to save that. Why? I was. Uh... You know what's sort of hilarious about that, the the origins of that story as well, is that I was flying back to New York from Berlin to promote Starship Chicago at the Architecture and Design Film Festival in New York. And I had a layover in Oslo. 
And so I was so thrilled to have this long layover in Oslo so I could go see Snow Hedda's concert hall. Oh, sure. Yeah. Beautiful. Right on, Opera the, hall. right on the water. And I was thinking like, oh, this is so cool, right? Because, uh, you know, Snow Hedda's a pretty big firm and this is one of their, you know, real big masterpieces. And so I was very much enjoying walking around on the roof and going inside and this and that. And then, you know, I landed in, in New York and it was a day later that the renderings came out of what they were going to do to the front of Johnson and Bergie's AT&T building. And I, I had this immediate visceral reaction. I thought, absolutely not. Absolutely not. And so I messaged my friend, Adam Nathaniel Furman, who's a designer in London. And I said, what do we do? <laughs> we can't, you know, we can't allow this to happen. And he said, uh, he said, start a petition and have a protest in front of the building. And so I put that together. He and I pooled about 200 bucks, which was pretty much all the money we had at the time. And I contacted Liz Waitakis of Doko Momo. And I said, will you help me? And she said, of course, we'll help you. And then I, uh, I knew we needed like a, a celebrity ringer architect to guarantee the press coverage that I wanted. And so I called Bob Stern's office. And I said, will Bob come to the protest? And they said, well, you know, Bob's not really into protests. I said, yeah, but Bob's really into publicity. And they laughed. And I thought, ah, I think we'll get Bob. And he came with the model. And, you know, it's always been such a controversial building. And I thought that, you know, if we can get the ball rolling because it's New York, because it's the AT&T building, because it's postmodernism, uh, the international press should pick it up and we should be able to get the building saved for about 200 bucks. What a deal. Yeah, it was, it was pretty good. Now, was this the first major effort to save a postmodern building? Well, no. They have successfully landmarked the, the Portland building that Michael Graves did. And then they, they had to change some of the features of it to bring it up to code. Uh, and they did some other things to it that were sort of discussed whether or not that would alter the landmark status of the building. But I'm almost positive that that's on the National Register. Obviously, the situation in Chicago with the state of Illinois Center is still very much up in the air. Although if you ask any reasonable architecture historian, that building qualifies across the board for protected status. But certainly getting the AT&T building landmarked very, very decidedly as an example of postmodernism, as, you know, essentially the textbook example of postmodernism, that was a huge step. That was good PR for the postmodern movement. Of course, if you talk to, <laughs> I called somewhat naively, I called Denise Scott Brown when I was trying to get a bunch of signatures from well-known architects in a letter that I sent to the New York Times. And I called her and I said, you know, would you sign this petition. And she said, young man, that's a very brave question that you're asking me. She was like, no, I will not. I will not <laughs> sign this petition. Philip Johnson took all our ideas and he, you know, it was a, that building is a bastardization of everything that we were trying to do. And, and then we wound up having a really lovely conversation for close to an hour about architecture and this and that. And she said, Next time, when you have a more, what was the word she used, a more worthy building, feel free to call me again. And I said, okay, thank you, Mr. Denise Scott Brown. That, that's a great story. Yeah, that was a good one. You know, I'm a big fan of Philip Johnson, but personally, I can't, I just can't get that building. But a building that I have now come to love, which I didn't know much about, was the Mouse Bunker, the subject of your movie. Yeah. It's just really a thrilling building and story. Tell us about how the building got started. What caused it to be built? Sure. Uh, in Berlin, in the, well, ever since the wall went up, you had this sort of, in, in addition to the political ideological battle that was going on between the East and the West, you had a sort of architectural battle that was going on as well, where each side was trying to demonstrate its superiority in terms of aesthetics and the, the sort of the look of contemporary architecture. 
And so in West Berlin, they, they spent a lot of time and they spent a lot of money on representative buildings for public institutions, including the Free University of Berlin, which was down in the southwest of Berlin. And that included science and medical research buildings, which is where the, the Moise bunker, the, the mouse bunker, comes into play. And the building took quite some time. It was designed in the 60s, and then it wasn't finished until 1980. So you can imagine that at this point, the, the whole sort of brutalist phase was decided was gone, on, yes. on the way out. I mean, yes. you know, funny enough, Philip Johnson and John Berge designed that AT&T building in 1979. So, you know, we're, we're way past brutalism at this point. And then in 1980, this stranded warship of a thing made out of precast concrete elements opens in the southwest of Berlin. And it is an, an animal research facility. It's where, you know, mice were tortured to death. I mean, the, the, the name Moise Bunker is a little bit ironic because it, it assumes that there may be in, in charge of the facility, which I can assure you is not the case. But this was essentially like pharmaceutical research, right? Yeah, scientific research. And, okay. I mean, it wasn't just a place where people killed mice for sport or something like that. No, no. And, you know, what's funny is that the reason that the building is empty today is not because we no longer do experiment, medical experiments on animals. They just moved their new facility a little bit farther outside the city. What does a building look like? Since we're a podcast, you'll need to describe it. It looks like a warship out of a science fiction film. It's a very long, canted building with these large blue exhaust pipes that stick out of it that resemble uh, the cannons that you would see on battleships. There's some sequences that I actually wound up shooting myself of the building in the snow. And if you've ever seen The Empire Strikes Back, the second Star Wars film, it looks like this sort of bunker or this sort of crashed oh, right. spaceship yes. on Hoth. Yeah. So it, it's certainly not what I would call a, uh, a friendly looking building, but it has this innate sort of raw power and this sort of dark charisma to it. People are predictably floored whenever they see it in person. And that's where a lot of the building's sort of notoriety has come from of late is because people go down to see this. It's, it's very Instagrammable, as we would say. Yeah, we used to call that photogenic, but now it's Instagrammable, right? <laughs> of course. When did the pharmaceutical function of it stop? It's been vacant for uh, a couple years now. And they have just sort of been keeping that when we took a tour through the building and filmed all inside, it's completely empty. They're totally cleaned out because they built this new facility for this purpose. And that's kind of why Charité, the, the hospital group, is sort of keen to demolish the building is because it was built very specifically for this purpose of animal research and it's no longer being done then, the question is, well, what could you then turn the building into? Most of the building is windowless. Large sections of the building cannot be, uh, you can't go into them unless you've got the sort of the HVAC system actively running. Otherwise, there's no air. And then there are these huge sort of middle floors that are all given over to the HVAC system. So it's sort of like a giant bunker lab thing. And did the hospital group own it all along? Yeah, Charité's always owned it. Has always owned it. Okay. Yeah. In looking at your movie, I just couldn't help think, looking at all the piping and the old scientific equipment and the way it was laid out and everything, it's like, wouldn't this make an incredible brewery? Oh, huh. you know, that hasn't that hasn't been suggested yet. Uh, I mean, you could see setting up all the pipes and the tanks and everything in there, and you wouldn't need to have windows for your tanks of beer. Or a Moisebunker brew. Yeah. <laughs> There's your business plan. Yeah. Charité has been, been uh, a little bit non-responsive to the more creative ideas that have come out. But you know, man, Germans and beer, maybe that's the, maybe that's how to crack this nut. 
because you would think that in addition to producing it there, you could make these little terraces in place. You could outfit it so people could come tour the beer making process, do some sampling, you know, and what a what an Instagrammable moment at your Mouse Bunker Brewery. 100%. We actually had a screening of the film on one of those terraces in front of the building with a big screen and then the Moise bunker behind. And as the sky was getting darker and darker, the building was sort of disappearing and the moon was rising in the back while you've got the images of the building on the screen right in front of you. And it was, it was a really spectacular event. And we had, 120 people come down there. It's not as easily accessible as some of the other places that you can get to in Berlin on public transit, but the programming that they've done successfully proves that people will go to these places that are not, you know, directly in the city center if they feel that the architecture is of value, if they feel that there is a sort of a cultural worth to a unique place and everybody can admit that this is a unique building. Does the hospital system have to get any kind of approvals to move forward or are they just kind of biding their time before they're going to destroy it anyway? Well, one of the interesting things that happened was while we were making the film about the Moise Bunker and the Moise Bunker is the star of the film, so to say, but the film actually concerned it's two buildings. And uh, the other one is the former Hygiene Institute, which is right across the street from the Moise Bunker. And Charité had plans to demolish both of those buildings. And over the course of making the film, Charité backtracked on the Higena Institute, the Hygiene Institute, and said, you know what? We're actually going to repurpose this building and refurbish this building and we're going to find a new use for it. And that building is now an official landmark. So it indicates that, as one of the architects in the film puts it, there are learning curves to these institutions. You know, we went through a similar process with AT&T when all of a sudden the, the giant faceless international conglomerate of real estate people who own the building suddenly said, well, you know, it's really such an honor to have such an iconic building in in our portfolio. It's like, oh, yeah, you mean the one you were about to rip the face off of? Yeah, that one. Yeah. So the the thing with the Moise Bunker is that it's just pretty, it's going to be tricky to find an adaptive reuse. We just found one, Nathan. I think we got it here. That's true. I have to. I have to say, I, I, the next time I have a meeting with any of these people, I'll definitely have to have to bring that up because honestly, that hasn't yet come up, and that is a really a stroke of genius. Uh, well, you know, if if they do it, please invite us over because we'd like to be there for the opening ceremony of the brewery. First rounds on me. <laughs> Prost, as they say. Did you find any special secret rooms in the place as you were exploring any really unusual? Oh, the whole, you know, it, my, my cinematographer, Kevin Klein, when we were in there together, I thought I was never going to be able to get him out of there because the building is just, it goes on and on and on. There are lots of very creepy sort of orange and yellow tiled hallways. It has a bit of a shining kind of feel to it. I saw at that times. from some of the photos. Yeah. Yeah. You think Jack Nicholson is going to peek out from behind a corner. For sure. It has creepy vibes. And you know, certainly with the with the whole history of the building, um, you go into these full stainless steel rooms. There are these odd little dumbwaiter sort of things where you pass from one room to another and all of this equipment can be sterilized. Goodness knows why. And a lot of like pressurized doors. Yeah, it's really weird. But then on the on the inside, on the outer edge of the interior of the building, there are these triangular windows that extend out of the building. And so the rooms themselves where you would be doing writing a, a report or, you know, you have a, a little view of the outside world are really quite spectacular because these windows are quite large and, and you can see this in the film as well. 
And it must have been really cool to, you know, to have your office with one of these or two of these big triangular windows. That was very surprising and very cool to see. But again, you know, those rooms make up the, the sort of the tiny perimeter of the outside of the building and the guts, the bowels of the building are windowless and they still had everything running, the, all the mechanical systems. So when you're in there, there's this kind of... Oh, no. Oh yeah, I suspect all that piping, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's it, that's why there's a there's a joke in. Well, it's not really a joke, but it, it's a laugh line in the film. We have a large power station in in the middle of Berlin that's been turned into the city's most popular and most notorious club, which is called Berghain, and it has this very industrial aesthetic with graded floors and pipes, and it has this. Uh, this reputation of having a sort of a sci-fi quasi industrial element. And when you're in the sort of the bowels of the Moise bunker, you're thinking like, Oh, this is kind of like Berghain. And somebody brings that up in the film. And so that, that gets a big laugh every time we screen it because it's uh, it's its own sort of aesthetic and world. So that the idea of a club has been brought up. And so having a brewery on site to supply the club would make perfect sense in a perfect world. Absolutely. Tell me about the pipes that come out of it. Are they decorative or do they have a purpose? No, no, no. Those are actually there to supply. Some of them are there to push bad air out of the building and others are there to supply the building with fresh air, as I understand it. And I couldn't quite tell what the scale of them were. I mean, how big are they across? Uh, let me see. They're maybe like the size of a dinner plate in diameter, but they extend a good couple of meters out of the building. I mean, they look like, you know, like the guns on yeah, the side giant of, a, guns. of a warship. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're big and they, and they typically come in sets of two or three. So they look quite imposing. But even the color, it's this interesting blue. It's not quite dark blue. It's not quite periwinkle blue. And then with this sort of dark gray of the, of the concrete that's aged over time, it's a very striking color combination. When we were doing the poster, one of the posters for the films, we had to go back and forth quite a few times to get that, that right color blue because it's sort of a very particular hue. Nathan, do you think now if you went back to Denise Scott Brown, she'd sign a petition for the mouse bunker? Oh, good question. Should see if I still have her phone number. Yeah, that might be something for you. Yeah, I, you always wonder how it's going to go from building to building. My dad saw the film and loved the film, but he said, Nathan, that building has no aesthetic value whatsoever. And I said, well, thanks, Dad. I'm glad you like the film. <laughs> the proud father. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And he is very proud and I owe a lot to him. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, brutalism is not his thing. You know, that's why when it comes to these types of buildings, this type of engagement, I think, is really important because, you know, brutalism is still a really hard sell. I would say postmodernism is an even harder sell. At least people can look at brutalism and, and appreciate maybe the, the ruggedness of it. Right. The mass of it, yes. Yeah, exactly. Or this kind of, in, in the case of the mouse bunker, this somewhat threatening kind of... It, yeah. it, it, the snow-covered ship on Hoth. Yes. Yeah, exactly. You know, people, people sort of innately sort of understand or it taps into their existential fears or aesthetic predilections maybe even. But yeah, postmodernism, people are like, oh God, that was garbage when it was built. It was garbage now. <laughs> The film is Battleship Berlin. Thanks so much, Nathan, for talking with me. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on the show. And Denise Scott Brown, expect a call. I'll call you soon, Denise. That was George with Nathan Eddy and the new film Battleship Berlin. Singer, songwriter, and siren, Storm Large, was born and raised in suburban Southborough, Massachusetts. From the age of five, she started singing and writing songs and attended the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York. In 2002, she moved to Portland, Oregon, originally planning to quit music and attend the Western Culinary Institute. 
But at the urging of friends, she began singing with a band called The Balls. Storm attracted national attention as a contestant on rock star Supernova, and she's the author of Crazy Enough, named Oprah's Book of the Week. Storm tours with her own band, Le Bonheur, as well as internationally with Pink Martini. Welcome, Storm. Hi, how are you guys? We are great. It's so nice to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. It sounds like you guys interviewed quite a few uh, amazing jazz musicians, and maybe they could maybe lend a hand with your theme song and help you guys out yeah. with that. <laughs> well, you know, uh, you can be the first to volunteer, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Just send me a couple of words, and I'll, and I'll work something cool out for you. Okay, oh, wonderful. With no, okay. with no swears. All right. <laughs> well, before we get started, I have a question. Okay. When you were on America's Got Talent, there mm-hmm. was this odd exchange between you and Simon Cowell. He asked if you had met before, and you gave a very deflective answer. Had you actually met before? No, I was just trying to be funny that maybe we had had some biblical Rendezvous. relations back in the day. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of, oh. you know, sometimes men see women. Have I? Have we met? Have we met before? Right. He wasn't flirting. He wasn't flirting with me. I was just like, just being a being a jack on stage. That's all. <laughs> well, it was pretty funny. I I liked it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Now, your talents aren't limited to the stage. Our ACE research team said you were once a competitive rower. Oh, yeah. I was in the junior nationals. I was ranked something like six in New England for my age. I think when I was 14, 15, 16. But I'm, uh, it's weird because I was really, really good. But I, I'm just not a competitive person. I had all this pressure on me, and I, I really just was doing it so my dad would talk to me. Because <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. he's a football coach, football coach, and very so this would be oriented. Where you're you're on a it is a skull. A, you're in with a team rowing in school. Uh, it was a four oars, eight oars, and then in the junior nationals, it was a two oar. And um, sculling is just solo. I don't. I've never really done that, but uh, but yeah, it was a a really, 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 really intense sport. And I just wasn't, I was like, there's definitely people here who are as good as me, but really want it. They really want to be sitting where I am. And I don't want to be here. Whether or not I'm good at this or not, it's not fair for me to take someone else's place who really is working really hard to be in this place, who wants to be here. So I I think the Winklevoss brothers uh, in the movie, The Social Network, were competitive rowers at yeah. Harvard, Yale, wherever they were? Harvard, yeah. Yep. Okay. yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, and they were a little competitive. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> but you were competitive, and you went on Rockstar Supernova and mm-hmm. did really well there. So there's some competition in you somewhere. Not, you know what? It was a singing competition, just kind of like America's Got Talent, sort of as a somewhat of a public appeal competition. But I'm not... I'm the kind of person who's just like, yay, everybody, you know, oh my God, you were so good. Because I was just such a lonely kid and music and singing and being funny and being flamboyant or whatever got me my social life and brought me all my friends and, and was the thing that I have that that kind of cured my loneliness. And so when I'm sharing that, I will always be competitive with myself and always try to do better than I did last time and figure out how to do something better always. But I'm never, I've never been the kind of person who is like, I'm going to be better than him. I'm going to be better than her. I've never been like that. I hate that. I think it's just not productive. Yeah. But I understand it's motivating for some people for sure. Now, how did you hook up with Pink Martini? Um, well, Thomas Lauderdale, the band leader, and I had been friends for a while in Portland, Portland, small town, especially in the music world. And Thomas and I did a lot of fundraising, a lot of political stuff together. And then when China Forbes had a vocal cord injury, Thomas and China really, really, really encouraged me to please just take a temporary spot while China recovered. And uh, I finally agreed and I'm really glad that I did, but man, it was, it was hard. I had to learn 10 songs in five languages in four days before performing four sold-out shows at the Kennedy Center in 2011. Oh, was that all? 
Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's all. I was so nervous. And they were so nice about it. And I just said, please, please, please. Because everyone's used to seeing China, who is this really stylish, very gammon, uh, dark haired, very, very pretty and, and ladylike and stuff. They're used to seeing her. And all of a sudden they're going to see this big tattooed punk rock boobzilla come out. <laughs> and they're going to be like, boo, boo, who's this hooker? Ah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because they have diehard fans. And so I said, you have to go out there first. And when you introduce me, you have to say that I'm doing China a favor. I'm here to help, not to take anybody's place. Yeah. And so he did that and um, ended up having to do that all around the world for that whole year because she took a while to recover. But she's completely healed and her voice is just as perfect as it ever was. Thank God. Thank God. I saw them perform a couple of weeks ago, and I have a question for you. Okay. Timothy Nishimoto, who mm-hmm. does the wonderful Yolanda song. Yes. He's on stage with this sort of dark instrument. It looks like a beehive. What is that? Oh, it's called a widow. A widow, it's like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's the rub it uh, with a stick, and it has oh, yeah. a, a serrated wood. And it makes a cool, it drags a cool yeah. uh, sound. And you can also tap on it with a stick as well. It's a we do. A we, okay. Storm, you evoke such incredible passion in your performances, so much that people go a little bit mad. It, it's very primal. Um, yeah. Our HR department <laughs> won't let us say more than that. But so our audience <laughs> does not burst into flames right away. We're going to start off with a song from the 1937 Rodgers and Hart musical, Babes in Arms, which was a spoof of New York high society and its phony social pretensions. It's been covered by Tommy Dorsey, Lena Horne, and Frank Sinatra in the movie Pal Joey. Interestingly, Sinatra sang the song with new lyrics as the gentleman is a champ at events for disgraced Vice President Spiro Agnew and Orson Welles. In 2011, it was a hit for Tony Bennett and Lady Gaga. Following that single, Bennett drew a sketch of Gaga naked for the January 2012 Vanity Fair, which was auctioned for $30,000. What a classy guy. Oh, my God. HR would definitely not approve that today. Here's Storm with The Lady is a Tramp. And I dined on mulligan stew Never wished for turkey As I hitched and hiked and grifted too From Maine to Albuquerque Alas, I missed the Beaux-Arts Ball And what is twice as sad I was never at a party Where they honored Noel Cad But social circles spin too fast for me my old bohemia is the place to be I get too hungry for dinner at eight I love the theater and never come late I never bother with people I hate That's why the lady is a tramp I love the free, fresh wind in my hair Life without care I'm broke, but it's okey-doke And I hate California It's so cold and so damp That's why the lady is a tramp I go to Coney, the beach is divine I go to ball games and the bleachers are fine And I'll read the time and memorize every line the lady is a tramp And I love a prize fight that isn't a fake I love the rowing on Central Park Lake I go to opera and I'll stay wide awake That's why the lady is a tramp I love the green grass under my shoes What can I lose? I don't 
remember that in a Disney movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I've actually played at venues where my reputation precedes me, and I get, I, we sometimes get the talk um, where they remind me that their donors and their sponsors are older and maybe don't understand some of my ribald humor and some of the more raw nature of my stage performances. And that's understood. I, and I totally get that, even though I, I maintain, I'm like, look, if they're older, especially if they're older women, they've been through a lot. And they yeah. can, they they're, can handle they're it. Fine. Yeah. Nothing and they, they haven't actually, seen before. Yeah, they, they want a lot of older ladies in particular. They're just like, thank you so much. That was so awesome and real. But there was this place, I cannot remember the venue, but they said, yeah, we, we can't do ladies at Tramp. And I said, what, why? Like, well, it's just not, we don't, we just don't like that kind of talk. <laughs> and I'm like, it's a, what? It's a song me? lyric. I think it's, it's from 80 years maybe, ago. I know. And, and I think in the original musical where it appeared, it was sung by a young girl just talking about how if a woman is real, it's kind of ironic, you know. Like, so if, I guess if a woman is real, she's a tramp. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm glad we've gotten rid of most of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we have. Well, we're keeping on keeping on, you know? I mean, no one's sketched a nude of me to make $30,000 <laughs> yet, but there's definitely some amateur photography out there that I'm sure will will do me really well when I run for office one oh, day. Hey, really? There you go. Okay, well. Yeah. Well, you know. Oh, absolutely. But there is still some shame around that kind of stuff, which I would love to be the person to heal that with some clever argument. But I think it just takes time. It just takes time for people to, you know, like cannabis is legal in, in, in a lot of places now. And in some places it's considered a, an essential business, marijuana. Yes, that's right. That's right. So back in the day, people were like, no, if you smoke pot today, you're going to be doing heroin in a week. And I was like, well, someone better tell Willie Nelson because <laughs> he's about to die. <laughs> Storm, you sang this next song on America's Got Talent. You unassumedly took the stage in jeans and a jacket like a mom stepping out of Target with avocados, paper towels, and toothpaste. No gown, <laughs> no hair. Just a good old middle-aged gal stepping up to sing a good old middle-aged jazz standard covered by hundreds of artists. You could tell the judges were prepared to be unimpressed. The song, I Got You Under My Skin, was written by Cole Porter in 1936. It lost the Oscar for Best Original Song to The Way You Look Tonight, but became mm -hmm. a signature tune for Sinatra. He sang it at all his concerts, a tradition followed by his son Frank Jr., Louis Prima and Keely Smith charted with it in 59 and the Four Seasons in 66. After the usual niceties with the AGT judges, including that exchange with Simon Cowell, Storm started singing. Then something happened. She blew away the crowd and seized the night in an electrifying performance. So here's Storm with I've Got You Under My Skin, and you can see the AGT version on YouTube. begin 
Tom, Tom, I, I think I have the vapors. I'm feeling faint. <laughs> that, that is like, that is, you took the song and deconstructed it and put together something completely different from that Frank Sinatra tune. Oh, it's just unbelievable. That's amazing. Thank you. Well, I, well, I mean, my uh, my piano player and business partner, James Beaton, came up with a different harmonic case. Like, I've been just sort of playing around with this, and I just kind of, it's interesting. When you have a hit song, a pop song especially, and it's just part of the culture's mitochondria. You've heard it yeah, a yeah. thousand times. Right. All the greatest voices performing it. So in a way, you know it. You know how it starts. You know the middle. You know the, the hook and the pause and the, all of that stuff. It's predictable and, and kind of safe. But, but when it becomes that safe and predictable, you kind of stop listening to it. You kind of mm. stop actually listening to what was being said. And so we took the lyrics and just reimagined them. I felt closer to its emotional kernel, which is I would sacrifice anything, come what might, for the sake of having you near, despite right, this right. warning voice that comes in the night. It's like someone who is, is obsessed and also kind of terrified it's going to end really badly. You know, heart wants what I've got it wants. you under my skin. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I made it a little bit dark. <laughs> when you competed again after this, you were in full performance regalia, the dress, the hair, with a really powerful song by AHA, but it just didn't land with the judges, and, and you really should have won the whole thing. What happened? Oh, you know what? They don't really, first of all, singers don't usually win. And I didn't expect to win at all. I just, I loved the challenge of, because I had been on national television before, 15 years ago, and America's Got Talent approached me and I said, no, I've been on TV. I don't need to do it. You know, I'm fine. Thank you. But they were like, oh, it would be so empowering for women your age to, to see you kind of blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well... I'll do it if I can just kind of represent to people that you don't have to be famous to be successful and to be a successful artist. But what ended up happening was, you know, they're a big, giant corporate yeah. machine. They know what they're doing. And once you're in that machine, you are what they say you are. And I still got a lot out of it. I still got to perform in front of millions and millions of people and do the fancy TV thing. And also my, my little brother, who's also in Pink Martini, Jimmy Harrod, was on the show. So that was really fun to commiserate with someone who was experiencing the same thing. <laughs> and um, it was scary. It was out of my comfort zone. And I think every artist should do that, should do something that feels really awkward and not easy because it forces you to grow. And their story for me was, she's been waiting 30 years. And so my fans were not happy about yeah. that. <laughs> but, you know, it's, a, it's the story, you know. People who get all their art and culture through the television, that's, that's all they know. And they aren't typical ticket buyers. They aren't typical. They'll go see things that they've seen on television. Yeah. Uh, so it's not necessarily my audience, but, you know, I still, I still got to do it. You know, right. I can't say, like, that experience was negative in any way. It was hard. It was really hard. But, you know, doing something weird and challenging is always, even if it feels kind of wrong, it's, it always ends up part of the next expression, the part of the next piece, part of the next performance, part of the next, next, next. It's all experiential. And I it guess all goes into the coffers. You sort of knew what you were getting into. This was not a big shocker for you. No, no. no. I mean, I'm 52, and I've been in this business for 30 years. Big business, big fancy TV stuff, and big fancy Carnegie Hall and Kennedy Center. And, and also, like, I got my start in punk rock clubs, you know? I never thought I would get further than that. I didn't think I was going to live into my 30s, let alone oh be thriving God. in my 50s. So oh. really, it's kind of like a goldfish gratitude. I just like, oh my God, my <laughs> life. I can't believe it. I mean, I work hard and I really have a overdeveloped sense of responsibility to my band and to my management, and to venues and to fans. And so that's really motivating. But it really, every now and then I stop and look around going, oh my 
God, look what I did. I did this. It's really cool. You have done this. Yeah. For a song that will totally rock your world, Google Storm Large Amado Mio to see her (laughs) performance with Pink Martini over the years. Well, this has been delightful, Storm. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for inviting me into your little world today. Thanks for listening. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Modernist Realtor Angela Roll. Okay, Tom. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 12,000 significant modernist houses, and access 4 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song was performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Rogue archivist and guest researcher Carrie Cesarino, mother of two, actually does roam Target looking for avocados, <laughs> paper towels, and toothpaste. Like Storm Large. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive Incorporated, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. George, and I'll be back soon with another edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. HR has approved this episode. <laughs>